Hello everybody. I know lots of you out there live in the countryside, so I've got my country attire on today. I like to go out walking the dogs and getting up the hills of Shropshire and through the forests and woods. And this story is set in a forest. It's called Badger Girl and it's by Tabitha from St Winifred's School. I wonder if you've actually ever seen a badger. Have you, Tabitha? Have you seen one in real life? Let's see what happens in this story. Chapter One, The Badger. It was a sunny morning in the forest of Florence. The pale morning light shone down upon the light green leaves of oak trees, on the silvery bark of birch trees, and on the little wildflowers of all colours dotted around the tree trunks. Silver flashing fish danced past me and my friends as we swam, splashed and paddled in the gently trickling stream. What a beautiful day, I commented. It's so sunny and warm. The perfect day to hunt for pine cones, agreed Abigail, who was scouring the ground. And climb trees, added Emma, who was busy trying to catch tiny fish in her palm. Suddenly, Abigail shouted, Ah! and dropped the twenty or so pine cones that had been in her arms. What is it? I asked, climbing out of the stream and running over to her side, Emma on my tail. Abigail was frozen still, staring at a spot on the ground, but... There was nothing there. A, a, a badger, whispered Abigail. A, a real badger. A badger? What, really, I said. Yeah, promise. Dad, I said, have you ever seen a badger in the forest? It was late evening and we were having a dinner of venison pie with boiled potatoes and gravy. Not that I remember, no, Dad said. Dad had lived his life in this house next to the forest all his life. It was a little pine log house with a hob powered by a fire, a nice sitting room and three upstairs bedrooms. Why do you ask, Caliad? said Mum. Mum had lived in this hut for nearly as long as Dad. It was only when she was ten she'd met Dad on a walk here whilst on holiday and had instantly fell for him. They'd been the best of friends then and later had married. Well, what... When I was in the fishing stream with Abigail and Emma, Abigail said she saw one while collecting pine cones. Well, in all of my 40 years here, lass, I have never seen one. Must have been released here by an animal shelter or something, Dad said, frowning. Bit strange, though, because they would have told the forest manager and they would have had to tell me. Anyway, how long was it? Did she say? No, but from the look on her face, pretty big. Well, then it must have been about 10 years old. But why is it here? said a voice in my head. And how? Chapter 2 The Badger Set As me, Abigail and Emma rounded the clump of trees to the fishing stream, I whispered, Look! There, drinking peacefully from the stream, was a badger. A near metre long badger. It had short stocky legs and a grey black bristly coat of fur. It was peacefully drinking from the stream and had taken no notice of us. That's the one I saw yesterday, Abigail said breathlessly. Suddenly, as if it had heard her, it ran off. Come on, I said, after it. We thrashed and crashed and soon I could hear only my footsteps. I turned round to check, tripped over a bramble and my foot suddenly started rapidly sinking into a giant hole. It kept sinking until it caught on a jagged rock. Using all my strength, I heaved and pulled my foot out of the hole. When my foot was free, I took a look around at my surroundings. I was in what looked like a badger set. Massive holes were dug into mounds of earth, a huge clump of trees encircling most of the clearing, apart from the small stretch of earth I had run through. Suddenly, a bird swooped overhead, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. This was a very strange place. Then I saw something that made me shiver and run. There, on the other side of the clearing, clearly visible, a dead badger. I bolted as fast as the wind, not daring to look back. Chapter 3 the way the sun sets. I hid under the covers, fearful of moving. There came a knock on my door. Caliad, are you okay? came the voice of Mum. I'm fine, I replied. 
Plucking up the courage, I slid out of bed and walked over to the door and opened it. Are you sure you're okay? Mum said. You look very pale. I'm okay, I replied. Well, dinner's on the table, said Mum, and she left. I followed, dragging my feet. A freshly cooked gammon sat on the table, accompanied by a plate of eggs and a bowl of homemade chips. I perched on my chair, agitatedly. As the happy chatting of the family filled the room, I forgot all about the badger. I was soon immersed in the talk. Dad told everyone that today he had made a hundred pounds selling animal skins and logs. He said we could maybe go on a holiday somewhere in Wales. Mum became so bouncy I could hardly believe it. Oh, what if we went to the coast or the hills or the mountains, she exclaimed. How about we go to a cottage in the hills, I asked. Perfect, said Mum and Dad in unison. I felt proud and pleased feelings in my everywhere. When the bowl of chips was empty, the eggs gone and the last few morsels of meat clinging to the gammon bone, we cleared the table. The last of the dying sun faded out of view in the window to the west. The candles were lit, the fire fuelled, and we snuggled together on the moth-eaten sofa, watching the embers flicker. Chapter 4. Badger Girl I woke up, the bright morning streaming through the window. I disentangled myself from my family and stared out at the forest. Today, my brain said, I will go and find that set again and get closer to that badger. Then I filled the kettle with water and started to make the tea. As I put the tea bags in the pot, Mum awoke. Morning, Mum, I said. Good morning, love, said Mum sleepily. I think we fell asleep on the sofa, I said. Look so, dear, Mum yawned. She got up, came over and gave me a hug. I'll do the tea. You wake your father. Dad, Dad, wake up, I said in his ear. Huh? said Dad. Oh, good morning, lass. He sat up and ambled over to Mum. Morning to you too, Jen. We were all soon busy in the kitchen making tea and pancakes. The last fat, delicious pancake finally slid onto the plate with the rest and we placed them on the table with the bowl of strawberries and the maple syrup glistening in its bottle. I sat on my chair and Mum dished out the pancakes. I picked up the strawberries and spooned a few onto my pancakes. Three strawberry and maple pancakes later, I settled my feet into my trainers and marched into the forest, a determined look on my face. Past the fishing stream, the old oakley and the blackberry patch. Finally, I was there. The dead badger, though, was gone. There was no sign of it anywhere. Suddenly a rustling came from a willow in the middle of the set and I looked up. A pair of emerald eyes stared back at me, twinkling in the sunlight. I overbalanced in shock and toppled onto a patch of wet moss. The eyes of whatever it was vanished, but seconds later a shadowy figure jumped down from the willow and came towards me. As a ray of light fell on the figure, a girl came into focus. It was a girl, a dirty ten-year-old girl with flaming red hair and emerald eyes, the ones I'd seen. Leaves, twigs and moss were entangled in her hair. Her face, hands and feet were thick with grime and she wore a simple dress of leaves sewn together. Who are you? I said weakly. Who are you? She said. Her voice was firm and determined. I shuddered and she advanced forward. I said... Who are you and what are you doing here? Uh, I'm, I'm Lydia, I muttered. OK, Lydia, what are you doing here? said the girl. I'm here to, to look at a dead badger, which I saw yesterday, I said. Now you answer my question. Fine, I'm Ivy, she said. Then suddenly, get down! What? what? I started. But she pulled me down, just in time as well. A huge black bullet shot over me. What? I began, but Ivy clasped a hand to my mouth. Shh, she said, looking scared. I nodded and she released her hand. She motioned for me to follow and together we crawled across the set to a big hole. Ivy shoved me forward into it and she slid in behind. The hole shut with a slam. All was quiet. Chapter 5. Rangel's Woodcutters 
I gasped. I had slid into a brightly lit room, perfectly round with a bed of leaves in the corner. Where are we? I asked. Welcome, Lydia, to my bedroom, Ivy answered. What? I gasped. Yep, Ivy nodded. I stood in silence, amazed at what I saw. Can I trust you? Ivy asked. Yes, I said. Then don't scream. Suddenly, she looked all blurry, her face elongated, her hair vanished, her feet grew hairy and she shrank. Before long, she was sitting on the floor, her eyes bright with smugness. You're... You're... A badger, I said in shock. The badger nodded. How? I said in awe. I am a forest dweller, and all people born to the Skarn family turn into badgers. But how? Look, come with me, said Ivy. She led me out and into a part of the forest I'd never seen before, and I was glad I hadn't, for every tree was cut down. The forest that had been once been trees was now stumps and blackened charcoal ruins. The grass did not grow and the wildlife did not thrive. Nothing was alive. Even the sun seemed to be dying as it cast a few weak rays over the dead and forgotten world. What happened here? I said in a sorrowful whisper. Rangels, said Ivy. Rangels woodcutters. Who or what are they? They're a woodcutting company, supposedly nice but so callous to nature. Why are they cutting trees here? The world wants more everything, so they cut down more than needed to make room for growing or building things they don't need. It's not as needed as they think and it's not good for the world. I want to help but I don't know how, I said. Ivy gaped at me. What's your surname? she said in a rush. Burchard, I replied. You're the one. The one in the legend, said Ivy. You're the one who's here to save all nature alike. Chapter 6. The Birch of Nature Ivy led me back to the set. The sky was turning a deep vermilion and the dying oak of sun was sinking behind the trees. This time she led me down a different hole. The walls were all covered in claw marks, but they weren't random. They made words and symbols in languages I couldn't understand. She sped up and we went further and further. It got darker and darker. Finally, when it got so dark, I couldn't see a thing. Ivy stopped me. At the end of the passage, I saw a light. It's never shone like that before, Ivy said, looking at me in a suspicious way. We both slid down the rest of the earth tunnel. We turned a corner and entered a room. For a second, I thought the room was empty, but then I saw a mound of earth. Laid on top was a beautiful looking birch twig. A strange golden light was emanating from it. What is that? I asked. The birch of nature, guarded for centuries by badgers. Only one person in every century can use it, and the spirits seem to have decided upon you, said Ivy matter-of-factly. Suddenly, a loud bang sounded from overhead. We dashed out, blind with panic, and found all the other badgers there. Are you up? Started a bigger badger than Ivy. Then he bellowed, What do you think you are doing, bringing a human into our set? You know it is against the rules I lay down for everyone's safety. She's not like the rest, Dad, Ivy retorted. A loud thump came suddenly from the other side of the clearing. A tree had fallen near the set. Anyway, said Ivy quickly so that her father couldn't interrupt. Lydia's not bad. In fact, she's the new guardian of the birch. You are, said the big badger interestedly. Well, I... I began, but Ivy cut through. Yes, she is, Dad. Come on. We'll soon see, said Ivy's dad. Follow me, Lydia, is it? I'm Raven. Okay, I said nervously and moved towards to follow him. So did Ivy. No, Ivy, it's just me and her, Raven said firmly. 
Raven and Ivy both turned back to being humans. Ivy looked livid. Raven, though, was a bit of a surprise. He wore a crown of willow on his grey flecked hair, a billowing robe of leaves and had the same emerald eyes as Ivy. We set off down the hole, Ivy looking sullen. We made our way down the winding earthly tunnel, Raven talking to me. Lydia, how did you come to meet Ivy? he asked. Uh, I came to the set and she was in the willow, I said plainly. And what did Ivy do? She jumped down from the willow and asked who I was. Raven sighed. She has been so much trouble these past three years since her mother died. How did her mother die? I asked nervously. Some people, rangels, I think, killed her with a bullet when she was out hunting hedgehogs and foraging for berries. Ivy said they heard gunshots and her mother had collapsed. Ivy ran back to the set, to me. Anyway, if you... He gave me a penetrating stare. If you are the Chosen One, then you, in a way, would be avenging Ivy's mother, my beloved. She was the best lass in this whole set. Honestly, the best. She was called Willow. He was silent for a moment then. Anyway, it's time to see if you are the one. We had reached our destination. Chapter 7. The War The birch was once more laid on its mound of earth. The golden light seemed to be stronger this time. Well, pick it up, Raven said. I edged towards the twig. It seemed to be pulling me forward towards it. I moved closer and closer until I was right beside it. Then, with a pounding heart so loud I could have sworn everyone could hear it, I reached out and grasped the birch. For a second, nothing happened. Then, the twig suddenly released a shower of multicoloured sparks. The sparks filled the room with a dazzling light. The twig elongated as the sparks twirled around me and soon I was standing with a ginormous birch in my hand. Oh my goodness, you really are the chosen one, the one, cried Raven. We must go and tell the whole set. He ran out and I followed. We ran so fast that we were out in minutes. Every badger turned its head to the entrance and gasped as I emerged, carrying the birch. Excited babble broke out. Could I make an announcement, boomed Raven. This young girl is indeed the chosen one, he said clearly. At the back of the crowd, I spotted Ivy roll her eyes. Who will join her, young or old, to fight for this forest? A multitude of hands and paws flew into the air. Suddenly, as if in anger at what was happening, a grumbling roar sounded and everyone whipped round to see the source of the noise. In the distance, a huge monster of a machine was moving towards the set, clearly on a mission to destroy everything in its path. The time has come, Lydia, the time to save Florence, said Raven in a grave voice. What happened next was a blur. Raven ordered several badgers to retrieve the old weapons from the bottommost chamber of the set. They came back with spears and axes made out of sharp stones secured to thin but strong branches, bows made out of vine and wood and swords of sharpened stakes. Three people emerged with handmade bowls of a strange paste and when the weapons were handed out, the fighters lined up to have the paste applied in menacing stripes under their eyes. Then, as they stood to attention, Ra Raven led Ivy and me to the front of the army. Everyone, follow the chosen one, said Raven, his voice full of determination. We marched, the silent, swift night sky, a lone hunter slicing through the last rays of sunlight like a knife through soft butter. The trees either side of me swayed in the gentle breeze, seemingly happy, not knowing the fate that awaited them. Finally, we came to a bare stretch of earth, trees fallen and an army of men and machines at work. Each inky black menacing machine looked like it could have swallowed our army in its vast spike-filled mouth. Both armies stopped at the sight of each other and glared. Then a tall, thin man stepped out from amongst the machines. Well, 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 what do we have here? He said in an English accent. 
Well, I never. An army of people and badgers. And a young girl. Why are you here? He asked disbelievingly. Um, sorry, I started, but Ivy interrupted. Not sorry. I gave Ivy a look and she fell silent. I started again. Sorry to interrupt your work, but we want it to stop. The man stepped very close to me and jabbed his finger in my face. We will not stop for a little girl, he said coolly. Then we will fight for the forest, I said. He went back to his gang. Let the fight commence, he shouted. It was a dreadful war. Man and machine fought man and badger. All around, dead bodies and shattered machinery littered the ground. I had a cut on my chin and a deep gouge in my leg. But I kept fighting for Florence. A burly man in work gear advanced on me and we fought birch to chainsaw. I was amazed at the birch. It did not break and it seemed to be telling me what to do. When I eventually got free of the man, I saw Ivy looked in trouble. Three muscly men encircling her. I ran towards her but then stopped abruptly in shock. Ivy was a true warrior. With her bow and arrow in her hand, she did the most amazing acrobatics I'd ever seen. Soon, she was free and ran towards me. She had a cut lip and a gash on her arm but was otherwise okay. I was here in the last war, she bellowed over the noise to me, so I learned a bit of warcraft. From then on, we worked together, both fighting effortlessly. We were winning, but then, sensing defeat, the thin man who must be Rangel bellowed, Bring forth the tree monster! A loud, rumbling, grumbling, swelling roar sounded at these words and into the clearing came a monster of a machine. It had yellow, malicious lights like eyes and a mouth filled with jagged teeth and huge metal jaws. What? I said as the monster loomed over everyone, its cantankerous eyes watching everyone and everything. Be brave, my noble people, said Raven. Charge, Ivy bellowed, and I charged. The rangel's leader narrowed his eyes and an evil smile extended across his thin face. We attacked the machine with all we had, but it did nothing. Then Ivy pulled me to one side. You need to get the birch to work its magic, she bellowed. How? I don't know how, I shouted back. Think about a badger and focus your mind on winning. Have a go, try it, she said and disappeared back into the battle. I closed my eyes and I thought about badgers and winning and stopping rangels. As I did, sparks flew out of the tip of the birch and surrounded the monster. The sparks doubled and doubled, hitting the polished metal and burning it. The tree monster was soon a pile of ash on the ground. The rangel's workers fled at the sight of this, including the thin man. Left behind was just our victorious army, cheering themselves hoarse. I was lifted into the air by dozens of arms. This had to be a day I would never forget. I would never, ever forget this day. Never. That story was Badger Girl by Tabitha from St Winifred School. Well done, Tabitha. I'm off for a walk in the woods.